I'm actually going to start with the welcoming comments, okay? So I'm delighted to see you all here for this roundtable on social media and patient engagement. I'm Deborah Jensen. Um, I'm a professor in French and global health, co-director of the Best Connections Brain and Society theme, and director of the Franklin Humanities Institute. And I want to begin by thanking the Global Digital Health Science Center, and above all, Erica Levine, who has been a truly invaluable colleague in planning this event. Uh, and also Hi, my name is Ben. In 2006, at the age of 29, I suffered over a Okay, all right. Um, uh, the Franklin Humanities, I also want to thank Leah Ger uh, Gerber for her assistance. The Franklin Humanities Institute, Best Connections, and Duke Cardiology have also supported this roundtable in a variety of ways. We think that the topic of this roundtable on the ways that social media are being used to create patient communities, disseminate educational materials, support advocacy, and even prompt and fund research on the illnesses in question is of increasing academic significance on a very interdisciplinary level. But perhaps even more significant is the fact that this is the first of three collaborative events co-designed by patients, their doctors, and related social media leaders. This roundtable is followed by a continuing medical education course, a CME, on POTS tomorrow morning, led by the absolutely remarkable cardiologist Camille Fraser-Mills. Dr. Fraser-Mills has innovated by offering support group meetings for her patients who come from around the state and the region and who communicate frequently on the Duke Syncope and Dysautonomia Facebook page. Following tomorrow's CME, Dr. Fraser Mills is hosting a patient luncheon uh, at which Emily Cardwell, who's sitting here next to me, will serve as moderator. Social media is becoming a major player in the management and research of health, and it, it is also a way that patients engage in representation. Our narratives of our health can be very important in improving our health uh, and on a variety of levels. Um, while patients with chronic illnesses may be frustrated by their inability to shape their electronic medical records, on social media a different kind of story is told. As a literature professor, I recognize social media as a kind of self-narration in new genres and spaces. The events today and tomorrow are bringing together parts of the Duke community that usually remain segregated. The humanities, global health, the medical center, students and faculty and local community members. Let me quickly introduce our speakers. John Stamler, whom you see on the screen here, uh, will be joining us by Skype from London. John is a member of the board of directors at Ben's Friends uh, and was the organization's former executive director. He is focused on sponsorships, member services, fundraising, and partnerships with corporations, hospitals, and physicians. John got involved with Ben's Friends in June 2010, a month after successful open heart surgery to fix one of his two rare diseases, atrial septal defect. In November 2010, John ran the New York City Marathon less than six months after his surgery to raise awareness for people with rare diseases and money for Ben's Friends. He's a graduate of Brown University and lives in London. As of March 2014, Ben's Friends had over 35 rare disease support communities with, over, with more than 50,000 members. The, organiza the organization's mission is to ensure everyone in the world with a rare disease has a safe place to go and connect with others like them. Jared Heyman, who is sitting next to me, is the founder and CEO of CrowdMed a digital health startup harnessing the wisdom of crowds to solve the world's most difficult medical cases online. And Lauren tested it and found that, that the community did, in fact, solve her case very quickly. Uh, she compared the five days to the, what was it, five years that before you were? Um, uh, in real life? In real life. Two years and $80,000 to get diagnosed in Crowdman, it took me five days and it's free. Okay, so that's, so that's a very good advertisement. Um, the company is backed by top tier Silicon Valley venture capital firms, NEA, Anderson Horowitz, Greylock Partners, SV Angel, Kosla Ventures, and Y Combinator. Nonprofits including the Knight Foundation and Emerson Collective, and angel investors including Sam Altman, Patrick Dempsey, Elad Gill, and Ben Ling. Over 2.4 million in capital has been raised to date. 
Heyman has spent the past 15 years as an internet technology entrepreneur. He founded his first company in college. And where was your college? Uh, University of Texas, at, Austin. Okay, at the University of Texas, Austin. No Texas accent there at all. No, from Georgia, actually, but um, now I've pretty much lost it. Okay. Um, the online survey firm InfoServe, which he bootstrapped from zero to over 20 million in cumulative rent revenue. He also <coughs> founded Intengo, a leading edge prediction mar market technology for market research. Lauren Stiles, sitting at the end of the table, holds a BA in Earth and Space Science with a minor in Marine Science from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. After college, she completed a two-year Rockefeller Brothers Fund Fellowship, during which she provided fundraising and public relations consulting services to numerous nonprofits. She then enrolled in Pace University School of Law, where she was the recipient of the Isaac D. Rubin Clinical Lawyering Award for her work representing several nonprofits in complex public interest litigation. After graduating with honors from Pace with a JD and a certificate in environmental law, she joined a private practice law firm in the Hamptons area of New York. Lauren has served in leadership positions on government councils, nonprofit boards, political organizations, and legal professional associations. She just published an article on POTS called The Most Common Disease You've Never Heard Of on CrowdMed that got apparently about 80,000 views. Emily Cardwell, sitting next to me, holds a master's in the science of nursing with a nursing, oh, and I'm sorry, Lauren Stiles is the president of Dysautonomia International. <laughs> Emily Cardwell holds a master's in the science of nursing with a nursing education focus. She leads the Facebook group's Once a Nurse, Hyperagenergic Pot Support Group, and she is a co-leader of the local Kentucky chapter of Dysautonomia Divas. She has experience in pediatric and adult <coughs> critical care nursing. She lives in Louisville, Kentucky. She will be uh, leading the patient luncheon tomorrow after the CME event, and she is well known uh, on POTS internet communities as somebody who really knows more about POTS on a medical level than almost anyone else that we are familiar with. Um, so uh, we will seg right into John's uh, uh, presentation. Well, thanks very much, Deborah. Appreciate it. And Erica and Lee, thank you very much. And again, I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but I'm grateful for the time. So before I, can you guys all hear me all right, Deborah? Yeah. We can, yes. So before I jump into things, I'm not sure how many people quite are aware of um, the impact rare diseases have on, on you know, people in the U.S. or globally. Uh, but there's 7,000 plus rare diseases. And if you look at just the U.S., there's 30 plus million Americans living with a rare disease. Uh, in, 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 in excess of 350 million people globally are impacted by a rare disease. So the numbers are huge collectively, but on their own, as, as many of you probably know, uh, a rare disease in the US is defined as 200,000 people or less. So before I jump into things, with that backdrop, Lee, can you just play that video real quick for, uh, it's a 60 second video on, on kind of how Ben's friend was started and a bit about Ben's story. Hi. My name is Ben. In 2006, at the age of 29, I suffered a rare type of stroke caused by an AVM, which is like an aneurysm. I made it through the stroke, but I still had to deal with recovery, brain surgery, and two years of waiting for my brain to heal. I was virtually alone. That shouldn't be, so I started a free online support group which became bensfriends.org. Here, those of us with rare medical conditions can connect with others like us. We share and we care about each other. No words can describe our bond. Ben'sFriends.org has patient support communities for dozens of rare medical conditions. These support communities help thousands of people in the U.S. and around the world. But there are still millions more to help. Our mission is to guarantee that anyone with a rare medical condition has a safe place to go and connect with others like them. If someone you know would benefit from a caring support community or you want to help in any way, please visit us at Ben'sFriends.org. So. So following along with Ben said, we have now grown to in excess of 35 rare disease communities, and we have about 50,000 plus members, and we do in excess of 100,000 unique visitors per month. Um, I think a couple things following that are, uh, if I had sent this, known about slides, I would have sent them. But anyway, um, one thing we've seen, I think a couple things, themes to, to highlight are traffic, it's all about mobile. Um, our membership is, has continues to grow, and a lot of it's driven by mobile. So we also, one thing I would say on this, on our organization, we created a mobile phone app. 
uh, which people have found quite powerful, and you can I can forward around the slides later on. But basically, it shows that the traffic uh, in our, our membership, uh, our members are accessing the communities daily, weekly, hourly, and, and a lot of the growth now, basically since 2012, has been coming from mobile, with PC growth still being there. Um, the thing that is quite powerful, and as, as, as Deborah alluded to, I'm a rare disease survivor and live with, and live with another condition. Our members, in excess of 75% of our members, are saying they get a positive impact from being a part of a community, both interacting with other people, sharing their experiences, uh, getting helpful information, and getting you know the support that they're looking for. Um, the testimonials we get daily are, are quite powerful and, and quite touching, um, and you can read them on the website. How we're set up is, is we're very lean. Uh, we're actually in the process of, of hiring a, a full-time ED because we've We've all kind of done it in the side where we can, and there's five board members, one of which is me, and then there's four others who are in the U.S. We have in excess of 200 moderators who are kind of our special sauce, if you will. Um, and many of these people have the condition or are touched by the condition. So again, they know what it's like to interact with other people like them, uh, and they can share their experiences, welcome people. Um, again, it's, it, I think it's something that's the power of our communities is the moderators, and without them, be frankly be lost and taking that a step further I think a couple things that we've learned from from uh, and that's one best practice one of many but one of the good best practices we set up a, a member a moderator only community so again it's all the moderators sharing best practices the newer moderators are able to learn from the, the more experienced moderators who have one head moderator who manages it all who's kind of made it much more organized and she's done a phenomenal job her name is Madeer um, so she manages all the moderators um, I think one thing, how people, how, how people find us is through Facebook, Twitter, um, but you can find us on Google. People search. Uh, we've also had, I think one thing I would say is we've had tremendous press. We've appeared in TechCrunch. We've appeared in you know, Forbes. Forbes.com is one of the, I think, top five or three most read articles in the history of Forbes.com. We've appeared in the Cleveland Clinics. Right up. We appeared in the Houston Chronicle. We've had great press. Um, but I think, the, you know, the, the, the benefits are members find it they get the emotional patient to patient support there's again it's sharing between rare disease patients caregivers friends family members um, they're getting recommendations for where to go who they've seen when they're going to the doctor as i was saying the, the e-phone or the iphone app um, and one thing i'd say is we 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 also did an ebook and again if any of you wanted i can forward it to you or you can find it on amazon is we did an ebook which was basically in excess of 250 members who wanted to share their story. So we, shockingly, we reached out to all these people and within 36 hours we had a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of input from people that wanted to participate. So we created our own ebook. E I think it's powerful for doctors, nurses, caregivers, patients, anybody touched by a rare disease or frankly anybody touched by a condition. Because again, it's, it's people's stories, it's quite powerful and a bit moving and, and very moving as well. Um, I think a couple of, a couple other services I'll, I'll mention is we created a doctor database, um, and we did this through uh, crowdsourcing. So we have, I'd say, in excess of 2,000 doctors, maybe more, on this particular uh, app or, or application on our on our site. Again, it's all about doctors, basic patients land on our communities, trying to find out where to go, and it's a, a good starting point. It's just a, literally a recommendation from a patient. So, for example, my heart surgeon's on there. My where I went to the Cleveland Clinic is on there. Um, so again, it's just a starting point. You put in atrial septal defect, you put you live in Cleveland, and bam, there you are, For in, in, as, in, as in my example. And I, what I would say is, is, again, for people who don't know anything about rare diseases, many people, and we hear the stories day in and day out, have, and as, as, I, I, uh, as, as one of the panelists who mentioned was, you know, again, I think uh, many people with rare diseases struggle to find a, uh, a diagnosis and many people take six to eight years in my case it took me six months of of extensive research uh, between London New York Cleveland Boston um, so again <coughs> that quicker diagnosis and these kind of conferences and, and these kind of round tables is, is great because again it's sharing information sharing of what people are doing um, how people again the power of social media has been tremendous for us we've been very blessed we have in excess of 50,000 Facebook followers in excess of 50,000 members, Twitter's been powerful. Um, but I think that, I guess the, the couple last things I'd touch on is 
crowdfunding we've been using. Um, the mobile is powerful. Uh, connecting people, using the power of the internet, no different than me being here on Skype, is using the power of the internet to connect pe people in a, in a way that was never possible before. People in the middle of nowhere who are suffering from rare disease, lupus or Crohn's disease or ataxia, are able to, again, connect with somebody who's in Wales versus somebody who's in California. Again, it's, it's quite powerful and frankly, um, again, making, most importantly, making sure people don't feel alone anymore. Um, you know, I, I think ultimately uh, we're, as I said, we're in the kind of where we are today is, is we are where we are in terms of our numbers. We're looking to continue to grow. Um, again, looking for more support from moderator, moderator support in terms of more and more volunteers. Um, we're looking at, we're in the process of just about to hire a, a permanent ED, which would be tremendous to take the group and the organization to the next level. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, our, our, our mission continues to be ensure that people with a rare disease have a safe place to connect and with others just like them. Um, we're going to, you know, hopefully launch more and more, more, and more communities this year and, and the years to come. So again, uh, you can find us, again, I, 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 I apologize I'm not there, but you can find us at bensfriends.org, we're at bensfriends uh, on Twitter, or you can reach us on email. So uh, again, hopefully that's a, a decent enough intro. Right, and thank you, Deborah. Thank you, John. That's wonderful. Um, and now we will just say directly into Jared's presentation. We'll save questions for after all of the uh, presentations. Thank you, Deborah. Congrats on the NCAA championship. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm Jared Hyman, uh, founder of CrowdMed. And the slide you loaded. Oh, no, we can't. Sorry. Our virtual uh, uh, panelist. Um, and our mission is to harness the wisdom of crowds to solve the world's most difficult medical cases online. So that's what we do. And as I think you'll see, we've gotten pretty good at it. But I'm going to start by talking about the inspiration behind this company. Because one of the first questions I've asked is you know, what inspired you to start a crowdsourced medical diagnosis uh, uh, startup? And uh, the answer is it's my little sister, Carly, uh, appearing here on the screen. So at the age of 18, without any warning or apparent cause, uh, Carly fell into this deep depression. Uh, she had other symptoms as well, um, anxiety, uh, lethargy, uh, weight gain. It was very unusual because she had always been a real healthy, happy kid. And then at 18, uh, in her first semester at the University of Georgia, she <coughs> started having these really strange symptoms. And it got bad enough where she had to drop out of college um, she was sleeping 14 hours a night. Uh, she was too fatigued when she was awake to do anything but, but watch TV. Um, and uh, she gained 50 pounds worth of weight. She uh, woke up several times a night with nightmares, you know, soaked in a cold sweat. Um, at some points during the illness, you know, things got so bad, she started having suicidal thoughts. So it was really a dark time uh, in our family's history, and obviously for her especially. And over the next several years, uh, Carly took really three years out of her life um, to try to figure out what was going on. Uh, our parents brought her to 16 different medical specialists all around the country. Uh, our family and our insurance company uh, racked up six-figure medical bills and just really trying hard to identify the root cause of what was going on. And uh, hopefully none of you guys have had to deal with any sort of long-term medical struggle like this. Um, but it's a feeling of desperation. <laughs> 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 I forgot my audience is. All of you guys. <laughs> So um, I don't need to talk about how, tar how terrible it is, you guys know first name. Um, and you, uh, she had experienced probably similar to what each of you went through, where uh, she would bounce from specialist to specialist, and each would identify uh, uh, or prescribe treatments as best they could and provide diagnoses, but they were usually very uh, not root cause definitive diagnoses, more prescription of symptoms. And in her case, we later discover that she had a rare disease uh, that affects just one in 15,000 females. Um, since it's a medically oriented crowd, it's called FXPOI, Fragile X Associated Primary Ovarian Insufficiency. Uh, you haven't heard of it probably, and neither had her doctors. Um, and it wasn't until she was finally seen by this top-notch interdisciplinary team of doctors at the NIH Clinical Center in Bethesda, that uh, as part of their undiagnosed disease program, that she finally got a correct diagnosis and treatment plan. But it took way too long and it took way too much money and, and way too much suffering. And uh, having spent years in my previous company studying this, this theory called the wisdom of crowds, um, I knew something that a lot of people don't, which is that large and intellectually diverse crowds of people 
tend to be much smarter than even the smartest individual experts in the world, as long as there's the right mechanism in place to aggregate their collective intelligence. So I created an early prototype of what eventually became CrowdMed. And using the system, 100 people retroactively identified her correct diagnosis in just a few days and at negligible cost. Uh, Deborah mentioned that Lauren had a similar experience on our site, where it took her several years and um, a lot of uh, doctors to finally get diagnosed with her disease. Um, but on CrowdMed, uh, retroactively, uh, the crowd solved it. What was it? I, I got a, a POTS diagnosis in 24 hours, and uh, my underlying cause figured out in five days. So we're vastly more efficient than the traditional um, medical system or the traditional process of, of a patient bouncing from doctor to doctor, you know, seeing one at a time. And I think the root cause of the, the issue with our medical system is what I call the uh, doctor house paradigm, uh, which is this, this notion that uh, there's some lone genius out there working in isolation who can, who can solve our issue if only we can find him or her. And it's this kind of paternalistic paradigm that I think gives us a lot of comfort to hold on to emotionally, but it's just not true. Um, the truth is that no doctor, no matter how smart they are, can know everything there is to know about all of the 7,000 known diseases, and your odds of finding that one person who, who can identify your disease is you know, like searching for a needle in a haystack. So we believe that a crowd-based approach, where we get dozens of people from around the world to look at the same data and collaborate with the patient, collaborate with each other, is a much more efficient and effective manner of bringing someone closer to a diagnosis than the status quo today of, of bouncing from specialist to specialist, um, which unfortunately many of you guys have had to deal with that firsthand and you know how painful it is. So that's what inspired CrowdMed. And um, I'm pleased to report that uh, now two years later, uh, this, two years after this we launched, this product that Carly inspired has helped solve literally hundreds of difficult medical cases for patients like her. And I'll let our success statistics to date kind of speak for themselves. So, so far we've resolved over 800 real-world medical mysteries on the CrowdMed site. And our average patient, you may not give how, how hard these cases are, the average patient had been sick for eight years, they'd already seen eight doctors, and they'd already incurred uh, over $60,000 in medical expenses to date. Uh, sometimes obviously uh, borne by both the patient and their, their payer, you know, typically their insurance company be the government. Um, and also, this isn't on the slide, but they'd also spent on average over 300 hours researching their case online before they submitted it. Um, so they put a lot of time personally into trying to come up with the right solution as well. And despite the incredible difficulty of these cases, um, I'm pleased to report that over 70% of our cases are successful, meaning that more than 70% of the time, the patient tells us that they got insights on their site uh, that, that ended up leading them closer to either a correct diagnosis or cure. So not only is our success rate high, but we're also incredibly efficient. So uh, our average cost to do this is under $200. Um, our average case resolution time is about two months. Um, our average case was particularly fast. And we also get an average of 18 volunteer case solvers, excuse me, an average of 16 uh, volunteer case solvers from around the world on each case. So when you look at it compared to the traditional approach, um, this crowdsourcing approach ends up providing about two times as many medical opinions, about 300 times less expensively than this case it cost to date, and about 50 times more quickly than this patient had already been sick to date, um, eventually helping to resolve a majority of, uh, of, of cases that the medical system could not. So it seems to be working pretty, pretty well. And um, to put all of this in a bit of context, I mentioned the prestigious NIH undiag Undiagnosed Disease Program that eventually diagnosed my sister. They get about 500 applications a year, and they accept about 115 patients a year. And they have a $5.6 million annual operating budget. We handle that many cases in a month. We resolve that many cases in a month. And at about 1 100th of their cost per case. So uh, again, very efficient, very effective compared to the uh, kind of best in best in class solutions that exist out there in the in the in the default world or in the traditional medical system. And in fact, these results are so compelling that we've got a group of medical researchers right now uh, from Stanford and Baylor that are writing an academic article about us, um, which we hope that will soon be published in a in a major uh, medical journal. Um, I was also invited to give a TED talk on our results at the TED Med 2014 conference uh, just late last year. Uh, that video should soon be released online on TED.com. 
Um, it's not quite out yet, but it should be soon. Um, so it's great to finally getting some recognition as well within the mainstream uh, medical community. And whenever I'm talking about our success statistics and ROI statistics and all that, I like to point out that it's not just about the numbers for us. Um, every single one of these 800 plus cases we've resolved to date comes from a patient with a real personal struggle, every bit as dramatic as my sister's or as dramatic as what a lot of you guys have experienced. And uh, we're now getting hundreds and hundreds of, of quotes from patients like this one. Um, we get more every week now, almost every day, where a patient writes in telling us how we either saved their life or returned them to health after years of struggle. And uh, it's not just about the numbers for us, but we're really uh, impacting people's lives in a very real way every day. And uh, I was also like to just point out that it's not just about all these metrics that I'm, that I'm sharing. Um, so I was going to also describe briefly kind of how our process uh, works for, for these patients. And uh, I'll kind of walk through the, the patient experience, and then I'll also talk through who our medical detectives are and kind of how that works. So uh, the way it works is patients start by completing our online patient questionnaire, where we ask about things like their uh, health history, uh, their uh, family medical history, their symptoms. Uh, they can upload diagnostic test results, imaging test results, uh, really any clues that might help our case solvers, we call medical detectives, um, ultimately try to, try to crack their case. Uh, once the case goes live, uh, we have a patented prediction market technology, uh, which took us two years to develop. We have two approved uh, US patents on it. And that technology is what we use to essentially aggregate all the differing opinions of the medical detectives and convert them into one coherent voice, where we ultimately can assign, uh, we can tell the patient, here are your top most likely diagnoses, here's a probability assigned to each one, and it's very helpful for patients, of course, to have the you know, 7,000 known diseases out there to have a list of two or three or four that seem very probable for them according to the consensus opinion of our medical detective community, uh, which we capture with a, uh, a, a point allocation system, which I don't have time to fully explain. Um, meanwhile, while the case is live and while we're collecting these point allocations and these suggestions, we also have uh, chat features where the patient can chat with the medical detectives um, and kind of exchange information and thoughts back and forth. Uh, we have a discussion board feature where the medical detectives can discuss uh, why a certain answer might be right or wrong. Um, and we have pretty sophisticated community moderation uh, features to essentially separate the good answers from the bad and where the community can flag or remove bad ideas while good, good ideas are kind of upvoted through our point betting. And ultimately, we're trying to separate the signal and the noise and try to really uh, uh, take out the bad answers, emphasize the good answers, so the patient ends up with uh, a, very, a list of very sane, rational, consensus-based uh, uh, diagnoses uh, that are usually much more insightful than, than what they could have had from speaking with one, one doctor at a time. Uh, at the end of the process, uh, after an average of 60 days on our site, the case is closed and the patient gets a, a nice, nicely formatted PDF report summarizing their results, which they can then take to their doctor. Um, and very often there are insights in that report that uh, end up leading the patient to a correct diagnosis or cure, in which case we've done our job. And I should mention that um, we're a tech company and we built this from the ground up to be a very scalable thing where there's no manual intervention necessary from me or anyone on my team from when someone first visits our site to when they get their final results. It's 100% automated from our perspective. And that makes it, of course, very scalable, and we hope to one day um, have millions of patients and millions of cases resolved, um, as opposed to the 800 plus, actually now uh, over 900, uh, that we've resolved today. Um, so uh, next I'll talk a little bit about who are these patients that we're helping. So the only thing they have in common is how different they are from each other. Uh, besides one diagnosis, which is Lyme disease, uh, no single diagnosis is more than 2% of our total, and even Lyme is just 2.3. So, and in fact, 95% of our diagnoses have come up only once or twice ever in the history of our site. So we don't really specialize in any one disease or any one group of diseases. Uh, we specialize in, in finding obscure diagnoses for obscure diseases that are often either undiagnosed or misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed uh, in today's medical system. Um, and in terms of other demographics, uh, age-wise, our patients cover the gamut from newborn babies to 99-year-olds. Uh, we tend to see a lot of either pediatric cases or kind of baby boomers. Um, so that, that uh, average there is kind of an average to extreme somewhat. Um, and about 85% of our patients are in the U.S. They skew slightly female. 
to give you some, some demographic um, idea of who we're talking about. Um, next, uh, people always ask about who are medical detectives? Who are the people on our site solving these cases? So I'll talk a little bit about who they are and also how we motivate them, which is key. So uh, we currently have over 15,000 medical detectives who have registered on our site, about 2,000 who have logged in in the last 90 days, about 500 um, actively on the site solving cases right now. Uh, about two-thirds of them either work in or study medicine. So these are most commonly med students, doctors, nurses, um, but really a diverse group. We have allied health professionals, researchers, scientists, chiropractors, acupuncturists, nutritionists, um, and other patients with that other third. So we believe in, in, a, in a cognitive diversity. We believe the best answers come from an intellectually diverse group of people who all see things differently, um, as opposed to, say, only allowing uh, Western-trained medical doctors, um, who we believe uh, are very helpful, of course, and knowledgeable, but have certain biases. So we like to have a, a cognitively diverse group of people who think differently and, and have different life experiences. Um, also, I should mention, we've developed a performance-based rather than a credential-based reputation system. So we don't base influence on our site on what your formal credentials are. When you first join the site, whether you're a doctor or a med student or a nurse or a fellow patient, we don't really care what your formal credentials are. We base your influence on the site on your actual performance. So when you first join, you don't have a whole lot of voice, no matter who you are. But over time, as you prove that you can actually solve cases and, and get high ratings from your peers, your reputation grows and your influence grows over time. So it's a true meritocracy, uh, where, where the best performers rise at the top and have the most influence, and it, it's not based on formal credentials. Um, we got to kind of, I guess, reinvent the wheel and say, okay, we, in our world, how will the system work? And this is just something we believed in. Um, I also like to mention that our, our medical, let's see, so I wish you guys can read the, the bottom row here, but um, uh, in terms of usage, uh, our medical detectives are very engaged in our site. Uh, the average active de detective spends over 11 hours a month uh, solving cases on our site, which is actually higher usage than any other uh, social network online, including Facebook. So uh, we're a very sticky site, um, as we say in the Valley. And this is particularly impressive, considering that um, our, most, our medical detectives are mostly uh, highly trained and, and highly compensated medical professionals. Um, and yet they volunteer their time because they don't make a whole lot of money on our site. Uh, they spend a lot more time on our site than, than their earnings per hour would, would possibly justify. And uh, that's because of the user experience we've set up and the incentive structure we've set up, which I'll, I'll walk you guys through later. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Slide's not advancing. Erica, could you help us? Yeah. Just click into the slideshow because when you move Skype, it went into the Skype application. So just click on that. Just click on the back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and of course, while you might assume that our patients would be most enthusiastic about us, our medical detectives are even more so. So about 94% of them say they'd be either very or somewhat disappointed if we no longer existed, which is kind of a, uh, a product market fit kind of question. 86% um, say they'd be extremely or very likely to recommend us to a friend or to one of their peers. Um, and customer loyalty scores are, are, are better than Apple or, or, or Google or um, you know, even high-end retailers like Nordstrom. So we have a very engaged, uh, very satisfied medical detective community, which is one of the ingredients in, in making our site work so well. So people also ask me, how do we attract and motivate these, these people who spend so much time on our site? And we spend a lot of time thinking about an incentive structure with, which really mixes both intrinsic and extrinsic incentives to keep our, our medical detectives highly engaged. And that's as much a part of our secret sauce as our patented technology. So first of all, the cash side. I should mention cash is not a primary motivator, but always worth mentioning. Uh, patients can offer a cash reward that's later divided amongst the medical detectives who perform the best on their case. And uh, we do have some medical detectives who have made thousands of dollars uh, solving cases on the site. But really, they don't do it for the money. Uh, the average detective makes only about $35 a month solving cases. So um, it's fair to say that they're not, financially, they're not primarily financially motivated. 
But we do have about forty thousand uh, dollars worth of cash rewards currently up for grabs, and that does get people's attention and kind of gets them to the site in the first place. But I wouldn't say it's, it's key to our retention. Um, we really design the site and our incentive structure so that it's the non-cash rewards that really keep people coming back, because that allows us to keep our costs down low for our patients. So for example, we have a point reward system um, and leaderboards to recognize the top performing detectives, and there's fierce competition to be at the top. Uh, we also offer skills development, uh, learning from peers, um, intellectual challenge, which is a huge thing. Detectives say they love to uh, just kind of put their detective hat on and, and try to really solve these tough medical mysteries just for the pure challenge of it. Um, and then also altruism. Uh, a, a lot of doctors and nurses tell us that they participate on CrowdMed because it allows them to get back into, basically refocus on what they got into medicine to do in the first place, which is solve interesting medical cases and help people, um, which is often lost in clinical practice today with uh, patient throughput rate pressures and malpractice lawsuit concerns and all the junk in today's um, healthcare system. So uh, basically, on, their, on our side, they can do what they do best, uh, securely, anonymously, and, and at their leisure. Um, also worth mentioning, and this is, I'll be wrapping up soon, but uh, we're actually looking to now start transitioning from a purely direct-to-patient site. Um, right now, 100% of our customers are patients. 100% of our revenue uh, come from patients submitting their cases. But we want to uh, eventually start working with folks like these um, within the healthcare system to partner with them to bring CrowdMed to their uh, either employees or their patients or their members um, and ultimately have them pay for the patient case submission as opposed to charging the patient directly because that way uh, we can save them lots and lots of money and they should be happy to pay a few hundred dollars to have a case solved on our site uh, that may cost them tens of thousands of dollars to have solved the patient continues to bounce within the, within the traditional medical system. So uh, we're throwing out there that we are welcoming leads from any uh, health insurance companies, uh, medical systems, including Duke, um, or uh, any other partners who may be interested in partnering with us to uh, send their patients or, or other constituents our way. Um, and ultimately, uh, we think we can save them quite a bit of money. So uh, that's pretty much about CrowdMed. I won't have time for questions at the end. Um, we're very proud of the fact that we've you know, helped hundreds and hundreds of patients, but we're really just getting started. And ultimately, we want to make crowdsourcing medical diagnoses um, as common as searching online at Google or WebMD. Um, and we think it should be because it's far more convenient than self-diagnosis, far more accurate, um, and also uh, relatively inexpensive and quick compared to the traditional uh, system. So ultimately, we hope to save millions of lives around the world, and uh, hopefully we'll be hearing more about us as we Thank you, Jared. That was very inspiring. So now Emily will be talking to us briefly um, about privacy and ethical concerns uh, in using social media. Okay. First, I want to say hi to everybody. I know a lot of you are in groups and I've met you before and haven't seen your faces. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about that's specific to nursing and medicine is that we have a professional liability that does not exist with the layperson. Part of that means that when we give advice online, when we talk to you online, we have to adhere to a certain standard. Even though there's not necessarily a legal liability, there's a professional one. So boards of nursing in each state can come back at you if you have a complaint, if your behavior is inappropriate, if you post things you shouldn't. And so that's a different level of concern. Someone like me, I, you know, created a group, I answer questions all day. If somebody sends me pictures of their labs, somebody sends me images, you know, an MRI or something like that, I have to be extra careful to not ever say, hey, this is your diagnosis, because that's outside of the scope of practice for nurses. So because of that, anyone who is a medical professional online needs to always be cognizant of the fact that they do have that licensure and that they can lose their licensure. And for that reason, I think um, you know, it adds an extra onus to behave, I guess you could say. Um, in addition to that, any conduct that is inappropriate, say a patient asks you about use, the use of something that's illegal in their state, you have to be very careful. You, know, you can still use, lose your license if you're talking about doing things you shouldn't be. 
Um, most nurses and doctors are protected under volunteer acts that prevent them from being sued in court for something they do on a volunteer basis. And that's because the patient-provider relationship is based on the assumption of care, and that almost always starts with an exchange of money. So if you pay me to take care of you, you're my patient, and you fall under all the auspices of HIPAA and such. If I'm volunteering to do it, it shouldn't come back at you unless the behavior is outside the scope of a prudent healthcare provider. In other words, if you're a lay person and you give advice and it's really wrong and someone goes and does it and gets hurt, there's no responsibility on your part other than probably just not being a nice thing to do. If you're a healthcare provider and you give advice and somebody goes does, does something and get, gets hurt, that is, and that advice is not something another healthcare professional would give, then you are no longer a prudent healthcare professional and you can be sued. Um, this is especially true if what happens is egregious. So if you step outside of the, the boundaries of, well, you know, this is a little iffy, and it becomes, wow, you really should not have told someone to do that. A good example is say you have a, a member on one of your sites who discusses suicide. It, you're, you are obliged to report that. All nurses in all states, I'm pretty sure doctors as well, most medical professionals are mandatory reporters. And so you do have to protect the people in your group and you also have to protect your licensure. So I think those are the, the main key points. Um, the American Nurses Association has an extensive code of ethics for nursing and one has to be aware that even when you're not in a professional situation, um, the American Nurses Association expects nurses to adhere to a conduct of behavior um, and, it, and to treat people in accordance with ethical standards. That includes respecting people's autonomy, which is a major focus of nursing, um, right, the right to self-determination, justice, equality, that kind of stuff. Um, you're not exempt from being a professional. If you identify yourself as a nurse, you need to adhere to that professional standard. If you don't identify yourself as a nurse, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? But in every year, the, there's a Gallup poll that's taken. And for the last 20 years, with the exception of 2001, um, nurses were considered the most trusted profession in the country. And you have to live up to that. You, you just have to be aware of the fact that people do trust your advice and not give dangerous advice. And unfortunately, that does happen. Um, the other thing you have to be aware of is that at the end of the day, you, your advice is given freely. You're doing this is because you want to help people. And that's a, really, that's a really incredible thing, that you are able to take that knowledge and that experience that you have and help people even when you're sick yourself. Even when you're in bed and you feel terrible and you can't work anymore, you can change lives. And so I, I see these things like crowd med um, and other opportunities for nurses to really make an impact on patient lives. And I think that we have an obligation to step up and help people if we can. And I think that would probably be the, the most meaningful takeaway. Thanks, Emily. And Emily has some ideas about how disabled nurses can participate in uh, health environments online, which we will uh, come to later. And now Lauren says. I think if you just advance the. Great. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jensen, for hosting this. And thank you all for coming. And um, we're really excited to be here today. My name is Lauren Stiles. I am the president and co founder of Dissonant International. Uh, I know I recognize some of the faces from the Facebook photos, and some I don't, but we probably have chatted. Uh, and I'm here today to just talk about how Dissonomy International is using social media to engage patients in medical research. Um, a brief overview for people who don't know what dysautonomy is, kind of a weird word, you've never heard of it. Um, dysautonomia is a broad umbrella term that means um, any disorder of the autonomic nervous system. So you have your motor nerves that control your muscles, you have your sensory nerves that control your, your sensation. And um, your autonomic nerves control everything else, all of your organs, your breathing, your blood pressure, your heart rate. So people who have uh, various forms of dysautonomia have um, a whole lot of symptoms all over their body, and they have a really hard time um, getting 
diagnosed. And uh, so we think what CrowdNet is doing is really, really interesting. And what Emily is doing is equally interesting. It's helping patients help themselves and uh, providing new ways for them to get care. Um, so what, what we're trying to do as an organization is advance the research on dysautonomia. So the, we think that the better the research is, um, obviously, hopefully we'll find some better treatments, but most of the types of dysautonomia are actually at an early understanding in the, of their physiology and, and really what causes them. So we need research to better understand that. Uh, let's see. So how did we start Dysautonomia International? I would say we were conceived in a hospital bed, but it's not what you think. <laughs> uh, I was misdiagnosed um, with a type of cancer, actually, which I did not have, thankfully. Um, and I was in a big New York City hospital research center, and they had told me I had cancer. And uh, after two months of the world's most expensive medical workup, I'm pretty sure my insurer had like a million dollar bill after this, um, they said, well, you don't have cancer. We don't know what you have. And we ended up finding out that I had POTS, which is a form of dysautonomia, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So um, my neurologist who first diagnosed me said, you know, I'm sorry, Lauren, this is a really rare condition. You're never going to meet anyone else who has this. Well, that wasn't true. Um, but I, I thought to myself, you know, if I can ever, I was bedridden at the time. I had been bedridden for nine months. I said, if I can ever get better, I'm going to do something so that other people going through this, at the time I still thought it was rare, you know, was it? but whoever else has this, I'm going to find them, and we're going to do something to make sure more doctors know about this because um, it's, it stinks being misdiagnosed and bedridden for nine months. Um, so then I had started this POTS Girl blog, mostly as a way to keep my family updated. People were always, you know, friends and family would call and say, what's going on? What hospital are you in now? What tests are you having this week? How were, what was your results from your tests? And um, it's exhausting when you're sick. You, you're very grateful that you have friends and family keeping in touch, but it's exhausting to um, keep, you know, keep everybody updated. It's like a job, you know, and I just was tired. So I said, let me write about it on this blog, and my family will track what I'm doing if they want to. I just tell them to go to the blog. Well, sure enough, all sorts of people who had pods started contacting me through this blog. I'm like, where are they coming from? You know, who are these people? So we took that um, momentum, and by that time I had joined some of the Facebook groups for POTS patients and, and dysautonomia patients in general, and I realized there was a lot of people who have this. This is not rare. Um, so we, a couple of us, uh, like-minded individuals who wanted to make a difference for this patient community said, we're going to start uh, a nonprofit, and we're starting small, but we're going to think big. So we named it Dysautonomia International. We had big plans, even though we like started in someone's kitchen table, like almost all nonprofits do. Um, so we launched on Facebook in October of 2012, and um, we are now on a lot of different social media outlets, but we've grown, we're still growing, um, and hopefully have a, a lot more growing to do, but it's been sort of an explosive growth, and what started out as like a little hobby kind of thing that I was doing when I was really sick and couldn't do much else has become all-consuming of my life, and my husband's life too, he's here, <laughs> we've sort of um, brought everybody down. And it's, it's been a really rewarding experience. Um, so let me move on here. So this is how we, um, some of the things we're doing in social media, and a lot of you are probably part of this. Um, we do education. Patients can learn a lot, so particularly when you provide accurate medical content. That's probably the biggest problem that um, you know, people have with the internet and medical is that a lot of the information that's put out there is not accurate. It's really hard for the average person to know how to filter through what's good and what's eh and what's junk. And so we try to provide only um, top-notch, accurate information that's been verified by our medical advisory board. Uh, patient support and encouragement is the kind of work that Emily's doing, really connecting people one-on-one, -on -one, helping people find people in their community that have this, that they can talk about the local, who's the best doctor in town or who's the worst doctor that you should avoid. Um, we also have created a, um, a, a map on our website that has um, a growing list of doctors who have expertise in diagnosing and treating autonomic disorders. These are pretty hard to come by right now. Um, we organize in-person meetups and events. Uh, one of my favorite things is that we, we get some of the world's best experts in autonomic disorders to come with us onto Facebook. Most of them don't have Facebook accounts. Uh, 
<laughs> but we, we give them like a temporary Facebook account and have them come to a webinar or live Q&A. And each time we've done this, it's grown. The first one was like 800 patients. The second one was like 1,200 patients. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger when people are like, you know, you could get free medical advice from a Mayo Clinic neurologist for two hours on a Tuesday night. That's pretty neat. Um, then we, we provide uh, content, or a lot of times like news articles that we've helped initiate or been part of, um, like the CrowdMed article we recently had, um, where we, we have something accurate that gets placed in the media and then patients can share that um, with others, you know. And, it, and as a patient, it helps, it makes you feel um, empowered when you can help educate other people about your condition. <coughs> do caregiver support. Um, there are a lot of um, pediatric dysautonomia patients and it's really good for their parents to be able to talk to each other and um, see they're going through things that are maybe a little different than what adult patients are going through. And um, dealing with school issues in particular is a big one. We, we do med ed is like the hashtag that uh, you'll see on Twitter um, when people are advertising CME events and um, CMEs are continuing medical education. We do quite a bit of that. Um, Public awareness, just in general, you know, trying to raise some awareness about this autonomia. Fundraising, which is important for any nonprofit. Um, medical research is really expensive, so we've um, been increasing our fundraising capacity, and it's almost all been through social media. Um, recruiting patients for research, that's something we do as well. And just expanding our network. If we only talk to other dysautonomia patients, we're never going to get anywhere in, in terms of awareness and helping other people get diagnosed. So we need to um, you know, talk to our own community, but then we need everyone to talk to people who are outside of the community as well. So um, research is something that we have really, really focused on. And there aren't that many people who research dysautonomia. It's kind of a, a uh, I would say like an orphan medical condition. It's not rare, like Ben's friend's conditions, but it's, it's <coughs> something that's not really common. You can't go to like every hospital in the country and find a dysautonomia researcher. It just doesn't exist. So we thought that um, our patients become experts in their condition because they have such a hard time finding a doctor that they kind of have to learn everything themselves to really manage themselves the best. So we thought, why not ask patients about research? What is, what, um, what do you know about dysautonomia that is not showing up in the medical literature yet? What do you want researchers to study and to document and to get a better understanding of? And what treatments are helping you that there's nothing discussed in the research? So we engage patients in these kind of conversations, usually on Facebook. Um, we identify needs. You know, sometimes there'll be um, a discussion about how, how expensive it is to um, get diagnosed. I think you, we lost John. <laughs> So anyways, um, we talk about uh, things that the patients know collectively, like through our collective knowledge, that haven't been studied formally, that don't appear in a medical journal. And um, rather than just talking to ourselves about it, hey, let's get someone to actually study this and document it, put it in a journal, so that everyone else can know this information too. Um, we have a patient advisory board, and they have been helping us um, edit study designs uh, for some of the major autonomic labs. It's pretty neat that they've allowed us to engage with them like that. And um, we also have had them doing beta testing, where a researcher will have a survey that's gone through institutional review board approval, and it's it's uh, you know ready to roll, but they will test it out on our patient advisory board members first to make sure that the questions really make sense, that, you know, all of the uh, technical issues on the website, because it's usually a web-based survey, you know, that they're working well. Um, patients are instrumental to raising funds for research. Um, we're seeing a real spike in that lately. And I think that one of the coolest things about our organization is that we give patients a platform. Maybe there are a lot of people who have dysautonomia who like want to do something, but they weren't really sure you know, how to go about doing it. So we provide um, basic tools that they can use to then go out in their own community and hold a 5K or um, do some kind of social media based awareness project. We have a, one that just started last week called Squats for Pots. There's a, a girl who started this. It's really hard for POTS patients to do squats, the exercise. Um, so she started that as a way to teach people about POTS and um, to raise some money for research. 
We do research recruiting. Um, we have a, a, um, the autonomic labs will send us when they have new studies that they're having a hard time filling in, uh, trying to get patients for us. So we'll just announce it. And pretty much um, every study we've ever announced, they get patients like right away. It's, um, they're kind of thankful that we're able to do that for them. And that speeds up the pace of, pace of research. So for as a patient, you want as much research as quickly as possible on your condition so you can get answers. And um, right now, medical research is really, it's a slow, expensive process. So we're trying to speed that up. Um, then when we have research, the most, uh, it's not helpful if it just sits on a shelf or in a journal that no one reads. So part of, a big part of what we do is spreading information when there is a new article Sometimes it's the same day. We publish it on our Facebook page, and we often try to provide a, a layperson summary. Just you know, what does this mean? How is this relevant to your condition? Is this there. So this is one of the studies um, that our patients funded um, at the 2014 Dysautonomia International Conference. Um, Vanderbilt and the University of Oklahoma had a new POT study that came out in February of 2014 that showed for the first time um, they documented antibodies that are attacking the autonomic nervous system in POTS patients. And POTS is a condition that um, doesn't really have a known cause. There's a lot of things they know about the physiology, but they haven't yet figured out like what causes POTS. So this was a study that came out in February of 2014 it was only 14 patients, so it's, you can't draw a conclusion about a large uh, illness. POTS impacts about 500,000 to 3 million Americans. So we're not going to change our understanding of POTS based on just 14 patients. We need a larger study to see if these antibodies exist in a, a, um, a diverse group of patients who've been diagnosed with POTS. So Vanderbilt um, was going to do this, and it takes, um, a, if we did it the traditional research route, it would have taken about two years and I don't even know how much money, but quite a bit. Um, we said to them, you know, we're a young nonprofit. We, we can't raise millions of dollars yet. But we're going to have about 400 people at our conference next July. You want to come and get volunteers to give you some blood at the conference. And I think at first they thought we were a little crazy. Um, but thankfully, someone at Vanderbilt had done a remote serum collection once before. And they said, no, no, you should do this. You know, So they agreed to do it. They came to the conference. They sampled. 180 patients in controls in less than 48 hours, and that would have that's what would have taken two years in, in a traditional research mode. And actually, that's me laying down on the bed there with a the turquoise shirt on, doing my tilt study. <laughs> um, and it was a really, really successful event. I think that the, um, there might be people here who participated in this, and the patients loved it. The fact that the research was coming to you rather than you going to research. This couldn't have happened without social media. Um, we we had to pay for this, and uh, as a young nonprofit, you're always pinching your pennies and really cautious about you know pledging to give out big grants. So we went to the patients and we said, "Help us raise 50 grand," and we raised it in two months. And that was our first big like fundraising kickoff that we had ever tried to do. We weren't sure if it was going to work, and it worked. So. Um, that was a really cool study. And totally, the patients were engaged in this from start to finish. We kind of came up with the idea. Um, the researchers helped us let our patient advisory board work with them on the study that, on the survey that went with the study, and actual logistics. I mean, we had patients like, you know, keeping the researchers filled with coffee all weekend because you needed a lot of coffee to get that much done in 20, 48 hours. This is, oh, I went too fast. This is something you'll never see. POTS patients don't like to give blood because we're already lightheaded and dizzy as it is. So the more blood you give, the dizzier you get. And this is um, a line full of POTS patients smiling, ready to give blood. <laughs> they were excited to participate. So I <coughs> love that slide. Um, another thing that I kind of briefly mentioned before is that patients, um, a lot of times people who have autonomic disorders, because they look normal on the outside, they uh, have a lot of people in their lives that might not really understand what they're going through. And sometimes they have people who are kind of skeptical. Well, oh, maybe you're not really that sick, or you know, you're just whining. And it's very hard as a patient. If you're already sick and you're trying to deal with your own stuff, and then having people kind of judge you, it doesn't, it just makes things worse. So 
one thing that we do is when we have these um, newspaper articles come out, whether it's a New York Times article that just happened on POTS a few weeks ago, or we got an article in Cosmo, um, patients can share that around on their own personal pages and their own social media, and that helps validate what they're going through. You know, if another patient has um, told their story to the New York Times, and it's just as crazy as the story that you have about being misdiagnosed with cancer or something like that, when you share that and your friends and family read it, they, they're maybe more likely to say, yeah, wow, that is a, a really crummy thing that you're going through, and instead of constantly questioning, well, you look fine. Um, so getting the media um, stories and, and sharing them on the internet is um, pretty cool. Um, a little more detail on how we've been recruiting for research. Um, when, when the autonomic labs need help <coughs> recruiting, they've been contacting us, and we will post uh, their studies on our site as you know, looking that, that they we're looking, that they're looking for studies with contact info for them directly. Um, we've recruited for online surveys. We've done some of our own without IRB approval, just kind of informal, trying to get some baseline information on our patient population. And then we've done recruiting for um, IRB approved real research studies that get published in journals. And that's been pretty neat. The first one that we did was with um, Amanda Ross, who is a young POTS patient who just started her PhD in neuroscience. And she asked us if we could use this tool to help her recruit people for a survey on brain fog in POTS. Brain fog is a, a term POTS patients use to explain um, cognitive dysfunction, they get kind of cloudy thinking, and when you're lightheaded and dizzy, it's hard to concentrate, and you kind of have memory issues sometimes. No one had ever studied this before in POTS, and Amanda wanted to do it. So um, we said, sure, you know, get your survey IRB approved, and then we'll share it. And she had, I think, like 140 patients in like a day or two responded. And she presented this at the American Autonomic Society meeting in, um, I think it was in Hawaii that year, and she's very young, she looks like a little kid. Don't know if she's watching from the academy for saying that, but <laughs> um, she did a great presentation, and um, she told us that a lot of the researchers came up to her afterwards and were saying, like, wow, where did you get 130-something POTS patients? Because a lot of the studies on POTS are 30 patients, 20 patients, 40 patients, and she said, well, you know, I'm, I'm working with Dysautonomy International, and um, they, they recruited this many people, like, you know, over, overnight, pretty much. And so um, we're looking forward to working with other researchers to do bigger studies on POTS. And I have um, something coming up on that in a minute. Next slide. We've also recruited for study databases. This is really essential for um, any disease where you want to have pharma taking interest, where you want to have investors, uh, where you want to have more NIH funding. You, to, in order to do big research, you need big groups of patients to be collected at one point, and we don't really have that for POTS right now. So we created Research Match, which is um, an NIH-funded disease-neutral database. So it's not just for POTS, it's for any disease, but we created a sub-registry on Research Match for POTS, um, which ironically is hosted at Vanderbilt, like two floors away from the Vanderbilt Autonomic Lab that does so much POTS research. Um, we also have directed people to the Autonomic Disorders Consortium, which is not really focused on POTS, it's focused mostly on the other autonomic disorders, which tend to be um, rare diseases. This is our uh, global map that we just have. It's just a, a Google-based map that Rob programmed for us. And <laughs> These dots, it's kind of hard to see on here, but uh, each one of the green dots is a patient, and there's some red dots on there that are, this is where we list our doctors and our patients, and patients can self-identify, you don't have to put yourself on the map. But it's really neat as a patient when you might, maybe you're told that you have a type of dysautonomy, and oh, this is rare, and then you go and you see this, you're like, wow, it's not that rare, you know? <laughs> Um, and some of the bigger cities, like it looks like one dot, but there's like 300 dots on Miami because there's so many people, you know, that overlap. Um, and that gets shared around a lot on social media. People get excited when they see that sometimes. This is, I think my slides actually might have got out of order. This is the um, brain fog study that Amanda did that was published that I mentioned before. I don't think it, oh, sorry. Coordinating to kids, it's not working so great. <laughs> um, 
The first one I had mentioned already was Amanda's brain bug study. Um, the second one is a study we did ourselves, this physician patient interaction in POTS. And it wasn't IRB approved, so we didn't seek to publish it, but we surveyed 700 POTS patients. And at the time, I believe that was the largest POTS study ever done. And we identified the average diagnostic delay in POTS patients is five years and 11 months. So we just rounded off to six years when we talk about it. Um, and it, it didn't publish in a journal, but after we put that up, um, Huffington Post wrote two articles on us and on this type of research. So almost maybe more valuable in terms of awareness to have a Huffington Post article than some obscure journal that only scientists are going to read. Um, and uh, more recently, we did a hydration preferences survey. Dysautonomia patients have to, um, have to have a lot of salt and fluids. And um, we wanted to understand better how they're getting, what type of salt, how much salt, you know, how much fluids. Are they just drinking sugary Gatorade all the time? Or are they uh, drinking coconut water? You know, what are they using to get their salt? And we, um, we're still analyzing the data, but there's some interesting stuff in there. One thing that I thought was really surprising was about 18% of patients were using IV saline. And I have used it myself. I don't anymore, but, well, actually, yesterday I did get some saline before I came here. <laughs> but that was just a coincidence. Um, but the, um, uh, it's controversial amongst the experts whether this should be a treatment or not in POTS. And we thought, well, without taking an opinion on whether it's good or bad, it's really interesting to know that 18% of patients are using it. This is the um, thing I'm kind of excited about that should be launching very, very soon. We've worked with Vanderbilt for about two years to develop what we're calling the Big Pots Survey. Um, there's such basic information about pots that is not known yet that you would know about other diseases. Um, the economic cost, you know, how like how, it took me eighty thousand dollars. How much does it cost the average pots patient to get diagnosed? How many doctors do they see before they're diagnosed? Um, what other diagnoses do they have? A lot of these patients have a lot of comorbid conditions. And nobody has really comprehensively looked at this in a large cohort study. So we're looking to do that. Um, it's got its IRB approval ready to go, and it'll just, I, honestly, it could be in the next few days that it'll get posted on our Facebook page. Um, it says we're hoping to recruit 1,000 patients in the first month. I think we'll be able to recruit that in a few days because when we did the hydration preferences survey, which was just a brief survey about your salt and fluids, we had 1,000 patients respond in a week. Um, and this one is a really important, meaningful um, POT survey, and we're hoping um, that, I think you could probably get five journal articles out of the content that's gonna come out of this survey. It's really exciting, and hopefully you will all take it if you're POTS patients or you're, if you have a family member with POTS. This is just our, our social media reach, um, which is, uh, I look at it and I think of like other organizations that are really big, like the American Heart Association or the MS Society. And they have much bigger numbers, but our patients are really engaged. We we have about um, 10,000 something Facebook followers, but they're it seems like they're on there every day, so <laughs> pretty active. Um, I love using Twitter because we can connect uh, really easily with. Um, like physicians that post a lot on Twitter and nurses, a lot of nurses follow us. And so the medical societies have started following our posts and retweeting us, which we love, because we're trying to educate physicians as part of our, our mission. That's, that's uh, all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's thank all of the speakers. And now you all get to talk. And do um, please get uh, fluids and uh, <laughs> snacks back there. Salt and snacks. Got the needles. <laughs> so um, let's just open this up to questions. And yes. I have a question about Crowdman. You're relying very heavily on these third parties to come in and be the, the resident experts and collaborate their knowledge. Are you doing anything on the data end without their interaction, like pattern matching, to try to? To even give them insight, like, hey, this shows as a high score for possibly this type of diagnosis? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in the future, we probably will. But right now, all of the intelligence in our site comes from the minds of our medical detectives. We don't do anything algorithmically to try to uh, solve the cases or suggest things for them that might be probable. Um, down the road, and we, we're, that being said, we're collecting a pretty interesting data set. You know, 
we've had thousands of cases submitted, almost a thousand resolved cases to date, and there's probably things we could do with that data to identify patterns and to start uh, maybe making it one day where a patient submits their case and our algorithm says, well, we already know what you probably have because you know cases that look similar to yours ended up having this. Uh, but we're not there yet. Right now, we're just it's all related, it's all based on our medical detectives, and we're just collecting data. Just to follow up to that question is, um, I was going to ask you if you have any plans to use that data or to make it one of your products, and if so, what are the HIPAA implications? Sure. Um, you know, as a startup, we have to be pretty focused on our mission, and right now, anything that is with design of all harnessing the wisdom of crowds to solve difficult medical cases, we're just kind of saying that's not our, that's not on mission for us, and we're putting it off till later. So there could be data plays in the future, um, but right now we just want to accomplish our core mission. So we're just throwing out anything that doesn't directly lead us closer to that. Um, regarding HIPAA, I'm asked about that very often. Um, I was asked about it in our lunch uh, before the panel discussion. <laughs> um, so uh, under the HIPAA law, patients are allowed to do whatever they want to with their medical data. Um, HIPAA applies and, and limits what, uh, what uh, medical providers can do and what providers downstream to them can do. But in our case, our only customer is our patient. So, uh, and because 100% of our data is patient submitted, um, we're, ex we have, we're HIPAA excluded. It just doesn't cover oh, us. Okay. Um, and if we were to start, if we were to shift and start having cases submitted by doctors or by, by healthcare providers, then um, it would be different. But in, in a patient-centered world, like, like our current world, um, it just isn't really relevant to us. Um, yeah, this is for Lauren. I'm wondering about this research kit and how that uh, might be sort of aligned with what you're trying to do as well. Do you know a little bit about research kit? No. Okay. Um, Apple Sweet. came out with research kit. Okay. Like I told you about this earlier. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's a way of... Um, of consenting and enrolling participants in studies through, uh, through an app. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering if you had thoughts about how that could, could, could link into, because what you're doing is basically what Research Kit does, mm -hmm. but, um, um, but you're doing it first. <laughs> so <laughs> you did it before they did it. So We're not but, making money on it either. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think, that, I think that's really, it would, be a, it would be a useful way to kind of add on to your other social media mm -hmm. channels. I think one of the challenges with uh, what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to get different, uh, if, let's say a patient puts themselves into a survey, the survey that we're going to do, which is going to be hosted at Vanderbilt. So they're going to put themselves and they're going to spend time, uh, you know, entering their data and their contact info and answering a bunch of survey questions. And then that's under Vanderbilt's uh, Institutional Review Board, their you know, ethics um, and privacy rules and everything. And now we have another research project at, let's say, Mayo Clinic. Um, and they want basically a lot of the same data. You know, is there a way we can get these doctors or research centers to share? And how does the consenting have to happen in the first place so that it can be more easily, readily shared amongst um, you know, pre-approved researchers. You don't want data to be available to everyone. You want it to be available to people that your, your, your patient community trusts. So that's something we're, we're thinking about actively. I have a question for John. John, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I was fascinated to hear about the ebook publication that you all did with patients' narratives of their rare illnesses. And I just wondered if you have any future publication uh, ambitions that go beyond um, patient communication through social media. I mean, uh, we'd love to do another ebook. Uh, Ebooks, uh, e magazines, are there any other kinds of publication technologies? Yeah, we use, I mean, we have a monthly newsletter. Again, it's updating people sometimes. I'm not sure people book. can hear you. Are you speaking into the mic? Yeah, I'm speaking into the mic. Better. That's better. better. Much better. All right, sorry about that. So we have a monthly newsletter which you can subscribe to. Again, it's things about going that are going on in the community, whether it's a, a new member, a story, whether it's somebody doing something amazing, whether it's an event. Uh, so some of that, uh, new communities that we've launched. We obviously launched press releases about new communities or new things that we're doing. Uh, obviously with the ebook, 
Forbes article, TechCrunch article, we publicized that. Ebook, we're looking to do another ebook. Um, oh shoot, I think we lost him. Is Erica here? Oh, it's, it's just the computer is slow, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go back. This is frozen in cyberspace there. Maybe you should take a question. Sure. Yes, let's take another question. I have a question for Lauren. Um, Pox is a, a symptom of a whole bunch of other things. For example, fibromyalgia. And I've been head of a support group for fibromyalgia for a long time. And had no idea that you guys existed or I would have sent millions of people to you. But um, <laughs> How do you distinguish between POTS as a, quote, syndrome or a disease versus POTS as a symptom of something else? And how do you work with that? That is um, a question that is like a, it's like a million dollar question. But Thank POTS you. itself has uh, objective diagnostic criteria. Mm -hmm. And we know that um, a lot of people with POTS have a lot of different comorbidities. So, um, and in my own case, I have an autoimmune disease in addition to POTS. And when we treated my autoimmune disease, my POTS got a lot better. So it's sort of, the question is, and it's really like, if you could figure this question out, you would understand POTS. You know, is it, uh, did my autoimmune disease cause my POTS, or, or did whatever caused my autoimmune disease cause my POTS? We don't know yet. We don't have precise answers. We do know there's a lot of comorbidity in these conditions. And part of the big POTS research survey will be asking about all of these comorbidities. I mean, we, I feel like if we took a young medical student and we put them on the POTS support groups, they would learn about every weird disease in the sun because these patients have so many comorbidities. Um, some of the researchers on our board have done um, comorbidities analysis and find that the overlap between POTS, uh, gastroparesis, fibromyalgia, fatigue syndrome, um, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, there's a lot of different, uh, I, I personally, I kind of think of these as the, we don't know what you really have diagnoses, you know? <laughs> they, and I think POTS probably falls into that umbrella, but I think of all of those diagnoses, POTS probably has the most, uh, well, and gastro gastroparesis has a very objective diagnostic criteria to look at the movement of fluid through the GI tract, but POTS, um, maybe more so, I had been told, oh, you have fibromyalgia, oh, you have chronic fatigue syndrome, and I remember thinking, like, what is that telling me? It's like me saying I have a headache and you diagnose me with headache. Gee, thanks, that's really helpful. You know, like, it's, it, it is what it is, but why is it happening? We don't know yet. We're going to study that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is John? Yeah, I'm back up. Great, wonderful. Other questions? Well, I uh, found a new group recently um, that was the pot, a POTS parent closed group. And it's like a ton, ton, ton more information that's connecting common symptoms. Um, and I wonder, is there a way to feed that back to the doctors? I'm um, finding uh, one of the things that happens in our family um, is uh, quite a few of the patients lose movement. And we've seen doctor after doctor after doctor who will say, oh, well, that's not part of what you're having, that, that's a psychological element. Well, it turns out there's a lot, a lot, a lot of people that have that loss of movement, and we did find one doctor mm -hmm. who said, oh yeah, that's not a psychological thing, it's the body shutting down from mm -hmm. the dyslipidomia. But how do, you, how do you get the information back, channel, once you see all these patients have the right. same thing, channel it back to the doctors so they stop labeling that part of it crazy and realize it, it's a health thing and we need to figure out how to yeah. fix it. I think that, um, I don't know, like most of the doctors, there's a handful of dysautonomia doctors who are on social media, um, but most of them are, you know, they're just too busy managing their huge clinical practices mm -hmm, or their research. Mm -hmm. um, we try to do that at our annual conference every year. We have time for the patients to actually, um, the, doc, the researchers will sit up on the panel and the patients will say, you know, can you study this, can you study that? Um, 
what ha why is this happening in so many of these patients and nobody's ever you know written about it mm -hmm. and we find that the physicians on our board are very much open to working with the patient community and they genuinely are interested in this because they want to understand it mm -hmm. so it's kind of just keeping that dialogue going and you know um, maybe it's something that um, needs a what kind of what kind of uh, motor symptoms do you, like oh um, sometimes that, well there's there are seizure-like episodes for some, some people before tr before treatment. Once you get treated, they do much better. But um, if just you push your body too hard, you'll lose either the use of your legs, or if it goes too far, the whole body stops. Yeah. All of it. That's like periodic paralysis. That's that's similar, like similar to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so that's kind of it's hard to do that on social media because the the conversation amongst patients and parents is helpful, but to have to engage the research community. Um, it happens more at the conference in person, and okay. we have a, like a whole weekend to talk to them. And mm -hmm. our, I think that that combination of people realize, like if it was just happening to you, and you had never heard of any other POTS patient having this, you would just think, oh, well, I'm weird. But then when you talk to a thousand, three thousand other people, and you hear the same thing over and over and over again, then you start to say, hmm, maybe you know we should bring this to the attention of the research community and ask them to study it and work with us on how to study it. Mm -hmm. Conference. <laughs> I have another question for, for John in London there. Um, do, do your blogs have any influence on uh, pharmaceutical developments around rare diseases? Do you, does this help to create advocacy for the development of new pharmacological approaches? I think, can you hear me right now? Yes. Hopefully. Uh, having presented at other conferences and, and met with various members of pharmaceutical, big pharma, small pharma, uh, I think they're finding it quite interesting to collaborate. And most of these conferences are all about collaboration. Because, and the reason I highlight these conferences is because it's all about patients, caregivers, pharma, uh, and patient organizations like like Ben's friends and 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 others like ours are kind of sharing, collaborating. Um, again, as you know, rare diseases are are rare, and uh, a pharma less, you know, pharma is obviously spending more time on them. So again, it's making them more educated. Again, speeding up the diagnosis, as others have mentioned on the on the, especially like CrowdMed, um, about bringing the pharma closer to the patient earlier on in the process. Again, there's always a little bit of red tape, if you will, because of the FDA and Regulatory, such you know, regulatory environment we're in. Um, I think it's getting better. The thing that I think is most important is collaboration. I think one thing I would add on the pharma part and and kind of how we work with pharma is that um, uh, we just recently received a, uh, a an arm's length unrestricted because we are a nonprofit unrestricted grant of uh, twelve thousand dollars to uh, which is great. And again, it shows that pharma is interested wants to help, but again, at an arm's length, unrestricted, un unrestricted way. So pharma's getting closer, more, more involved in understanding what patients are going through earlier on in the process, because these, you know, as you know, launching drugs and, and, and creating drugs for various conditions takes a while. One thing I would say for, again, people I'm not sure who quite know anything about rare diseases, is of the 7,000 plus, there's only, call it, 400 FDA approved drugs out there today for those rare diseases. So. We're getting patients closer to the pharma companies is the most important thing and, and collaborating. So, collaboration. I wonder if anyone here would, would like to just speak about what social media has, has meant in, in their own trajectories as, as a patient, as a member of, of a social community. <laughs> I'll <laughs> speak from fibromyalgia's point of view. Um, I'm no longer the head of this support group because um, people were so needy and they were so in need of medical backup in this area. They forgot that I was suffering from the same thing. But let me tell you that the biggest thing that they want is to know who to go to, who is reliable. I would think the same in POTS and the same eight-year thing, you go from people saying it's all in your head to you look wonderful and get out of my office. And so what I was, uh, what I think the most beneficial thing we did in the time that I was ahead of this group was we prepared um, uh, a 
a glossary of doctors in the Triangle area who were receptive to the syndrome and would not treat you like it was a garbage uh, syndrome or that it was all in your head, et cetera, et cetera, would actually work with you and seriously refer you. So uh, one of the most important things that, a, that any online society can do is to provide that, uh, that information for patients everywhere. It's the first thing they go to. I would agree that one of the, there's a kind of a, a process that happens when people join social media. The first one is, oh my goodness, there's people just like me. And it's a revelation. Sometimes these are people who haven't been diagnosed yet and they're really <coughs> desperately seeking the answers. And that's one of the places where people like me, I, I've had POTS for many years. I was diagnosed over 10 years ago. And so I'm not a new patient. And so when you've been a patient for that long, you can really take people in that early stage who are scared, who don't have a direction, who are just desperately looking for answers, and you can walk them through the process. There's a coping process. You have to accept that life isn't what it was and plan a new trajectory and accept that it may not be what you expected, but it can still be good. And I think that's one of the things that's, that is important for people taking a leadership role on is helping walk people through the process, is helping them understand that there's a, there is, there's a different way and it, it's gonna be okay. And like you said, you know, people are needy, um, but they're frightened. They're and I, I think that's really, really normal. And I think that if we can say, hey, look, you know, go see this doctor. This person is gonna help you. Go to this ER. They're gonna treat you well. Then that's a really important role. Um, well, I've been diagnosed for about five and a half years, and I was diagnosed at Duke. Um, and for most of the time that I've been diagnosed, my symptoms weren't bad enough to actually warrant any concern from me. Um, but recently, like within the last year, they have been. And I was at a recommendation of one of the doctors who will be speaking tomorrow um, that I join some social media groups. Um, and so I did, and I joined like some of the main pages. And then from there, I was able to sort of branch off, and then I found like, North Carolina ones, and even just like, I've been able to get support um, internationally, but also just in North Carolina. Like we have, I don't know how every other state is. I don't know, you know, never lived, well, I mean, I have, but not since POTS. But um, like, I've been able to get a lot of friends in the area who we can, you know, I'm 27, so I'm still young, and I do like going and being social, but it can be really hard when you have POTS because not everybody understands today is not a good day. Like, you know, I'm having a hard time getting up and going outside to let my dog out. So it's not going to be a good day. But I can have, you know, I have friends in the area that, you know, we, I can be talking on the phone with them. And then the next thing, you know, like they're coming over with dinner or something and they're playing with my dog. And so I've, like, I've also, I've had several people who, some of them are in this room, um, tell me like, oh, well, you know, it, it sounds like you have symptoms of this, it sounds like you have symptoms of this, you should go and you should talk to them, and you should, you know, if, you should ask them if, if that's what they think, and, you know, if you need further testing, and then I kind of shyly would, and I would, and then next thing you know, like, yes, I do have EDS. So it's kind of, I've been able to get more answers, and I've also been able, like, the amount of support that I've received um, just throughout, like, with the main groups, with the, some of the smaller groups, um, it's just been tremendous. So I want to say, actually, what you just described is one of the most beautiful things about social media, which is patient empowerment. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you are the best advocate for you. And that's very much a nursing principle, patient advocacy. And that's what, that's what you need to do. You need to be strong enough to say, hey, look, this is the test we need to do. I want to move through there. But you have to have support to get there. You can't just, it's very difficult for people to just walk into the doctor's office and be like, well, I know this, and this is what you need to be doing, unless you have something to back it up. And I think social media really provides the, the emotional and sometimes even physical support. People will go with you sometimes that you need to get the care you deserve. Um, can I, like, I've, I've also noticed that um, it, it took me a while to get more comfortable with, like, it, it know more about POTS, because I, you know, I had it for a long time, and I really didn't know anything about it. Um, but I have been able to, like, the, the farther along I've gotten in my treatment, the better I'm able to help other people mm -hmm. and that to me like that honestly because of who I am just makes the difference for me 
um, being able to help people and you know I can hear someone's symptoms and say you know I think you need to get checked for this or it could possibly be this because I was having similar symptoms that's that's like we see that on um, I run um, besides the dysautonomy international hat um, there's a, a POTS group that predates us as an organization it's a POTS just called POTS big Facebook group with about 11,000 change um, members and you see a really distinct difference between the newly diagnosed patients who are really scared, really confused, don't know where to go, have just been through hell trying to get diagnosed. They finally got diagnosed and it's a relief, but it's also an overwhelming amount of information when you're first diagnosed. Then you have the patients who've been at this for four or five years. And um, those who seem to get better or learn to cope better with their symptoms might stay on Facebook less often because they're doing normal life things. They're not hanging around in bed on Facebook. Um, so you, the, some of the groups tend to be skewed towards the newer diagnosed patients who are maybe sicker than the people who've been learning how to cope for the past few years. Um, but you see this transformation. I, I, I've been part of this community now for um, five years, well, no, four years. And I was definitely in the beginning that scared, like, oh my god, what is this kind of patient? And not knowing, every time I had stabbing chest pain, should I go to the ER, should I not? I don't want to go and have them you know, tell me it's nothing, but what if it is, how do I know? And you have to just learn over time like what is normal for your body. But it, having that support group, when I first started on the POTS group, I was just that scared patient, like asking for help. And I, I see myself, I've transformed into like, I don't go on the page for help anymore, now I go to help other people. And it honestly, it makes me feel good to be able to help people but I see other patients go through that transformation and it's so cool. And sometimes it's like a 17 year old girl who was completely terrified when she joined the group at 15 and now two years later she's given out advice left and right about which is the best doctor to see for a mast cell workup and you know, it's really cool to see people kind of feel empowered. Like they have not only control over their own illness but that they're empowered enough to help advocate for other patients. It really feels cool. I would, I would agree. It's very rewarding too when you get to that stage and you can start actually seeing an influence that you've created in the community. I wonder um, how do people deal with approaching a doctor with, oh, I read about this online, or this person I haven't met, but I talked to them on Facebook, yeah. so I should ask you about. Bring journal articles. Yeah. Yes. Don't yes. just say, my Thank friend on Facebook told me. Never, never quote <laughs> web. <laughs> you know. And there are, um, I know in several of the groups, people do maintain libraries of peer-reviewed research articles. <laughs> and it, there's, there's stuff out there, and always ask people, give me the reference, print out the research article, take it to your doctor. They'll believe that more than they'll believe you. I'm, I'm curious, for, um, from Jared's point of view, your yeah. patients, when uh, they get their suggested diagnosis, do they give you feedback on how their doctors respond to that? Like, do they have to bring some extra oomph, or is it enough to say, oh, I, this is what the crowd med crowd told me? <laughs> um, until our brand is, is as well known as the Mayo Clinics or, you know, whatever, I don't think just saying I got this on crowd med will be enough, uh, hopefully someday. Uh, so we, as you guys were mentioning, the patients have to be armed, and, and we do expect our patients to be their own advocate, um, because they're going to the doctor's office, we try to arm them with this report that helps them, ultimately to them, so to them to stand up for themselves and say, hey doc, I really think I have this, and here's why this community of people felt, felt, felt I do. Um, and we encourage our medical detectives, the ones who are contributing to the cases or helping to solve them, we encourage them to link to those peer-reviewed articles or to back up their, um, uh, their hypotheses on why a certain diagnosis might be correct uh, with something to you know, further arm that patient. I think you mentioned when you, when you submitted your, your case, the validation case, someone replied back with a link to a resource that yeah. Um, that, that was helpful and maybe could accomplish that. Um, so you could think of think of us like a a social media forum, but like on steroids, <laughs> where it's you know it's if you look at you know a, a Facebook forum or a you know a med help forum where you know light years more sophisticated technically. But at our heart, that's what we are. We are a collaboration space for patients and case solvers to get together, just with a lot of features. Um, that make it specially, special pur specially uh, purposed for medical diagnosis, whereas you know, Facebook obviously wasn't built for that. Um, and most forms, medical, most forms online are, are just kind of forms where people just you know, ask a question, people respond, but 
than all the community moderation features, point betting features, and reputation features that we have um, on our site. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it is all about harming the patient. And, and we do ask patients, we have a 90-day post-case survey that we send to patients 90 days after their case is closed. And one of the questions we ask is, uh, what was your doctor's reaction to your problem results? Um, and uh, we found that the, the general, what we generally hear most often is, at first, my doctor was like, oh no, something else from the internet. <laughs> I'm going to spend 20 minutes explaining why this is not right. But then once they dig in, and they see that this is, that these are filtered results. This isn't just you know, random people throwing stuff at the wall. Uh, this is the consensus opinion of, of um, a, a dozen or more people that, uh, that know what they're talking about. And they realize that the results are qualitatively different than something that the patient's going to get through Google or WebMD searches, and they're much more receptive. And maybe one day, they will have already seen so many CrowdMed reports that as soon as they see our logo on there, they'll say, okay, great, CrowdMed report, I'll listen to this, but we're not there yet. Yeah, the, the problem of cyber <laughs> hypochondria is, is something that I think we've all heard about. So how is cyber hypochondria or cyber chondria not involved, or is it involved in, in these different forums? Um, I think that it definitely happens on the Facebook support groups for any illness, not just for dysautonomia. I have family members who have other conditions, and um, I think when you are um, when you have a large group of people, most of whom probably don't have formal medical training, although there's plenty that do, um, you get a you know a group think kind of mentality can take over. And well, for example, someone could post a symptom. Um, pick a random weird symptom, I don't know, uh, you know, my thumb is green, is that a POTS thing? And in a group of 11,000 people, you're going to have 20 other people who say, my thumb is green too. And then suddenly, like, this idea takes over that this is a POTS thing. And it's not, but out of 11,000 people, or six maybe. of them had a green thumb. You know, so you have to, I think you have to be an educated user of social media for health issues. You have to know that these people are not world-class experts in your disease, and they're just patients like you. Um, and you also have to take everything with a grain of salt, literally and figuratively, because dysautonomic patients need salt, right? <laughs> but um, just to sort of not, um, oh, but I always think of it as, first of all, group rules are really important if you're adminning one of these groups. Very much so. so. On the big POTS group, we have a, a rule, no diagnosing allowed. I don't care if you're an MD from Mayo Clinic, you're not allowed to diagnose someone on our page. You can say, you might want to talk to your doctor about Elmer's Danlos syndrome, but you can't say, oh, that finger that's bendy like that, that's definitely ADS. We don't allow it because there are uh, younger patients on there or maybe less sophisticated patients who might literally take that as a real diagnosis and not seek the medical care that they really need to find out what they really have going on, um, which it could be right or wrong, but it's not appropriate for our forum anyways. We don't allow it. I know other groups have different rules, but um, I think a, t a discussion of the group rules is really interesting because, yeah, I know. maintain relatively, I have two basic rules, which is just treat everyone with respect and decorum. That, I mean, that's got to be the first thing. We're all patients. We're all sick just being polite to one another. But um, I think that even if you don't establish rules, I think that any good administrator is looking at what everybody says. And I see when somebody posts something incorrect as a learning opportunity. So I'll come back and say, well, you know, that I don't necessarily agree with that, here's why. And I'll provide references or something like that. Because I think that if you just give black blanket statements, um, First of all, I think too many rules and people stop reading them. Um, the other thing is I think they can, it can sometimes be misconstrued and people can get a little too excited about reporting, well, oh, this person said that. Um, but, you know, at some point you're like, okay, everyone just, we're all adults. Well, most of us are, but, um, behave. But um, I, I do think you're right that there needs to be some rule, but I think the, the most important thing is oversight. It, um, you just have to watch what's going on. You know, you're right about the diagnosing. It, that's, I'm very careful to always say, well, you might. You need to talk to your doctor about this. That, you know, to use those little caveats so that people know, I'm really not, I'm not practicing medicine here. Um, you know, and of course, as a nurse, there's a different liability there. <laughs> I'm wondering if John has, do you have uniform group rules for Ben's friends that you use on your different rare disease communities? Yeah, I'd say, um, coming back to my point about the, or comment earlier when I started, was the, um, our head moderator is 
put together guidelines, uh, kind of the best practices to share across all the communities to make sure that kind of some one of the other members, of, uh, the other um, speakers have mentioned about the point of of making sure that it, it, it all follows the same guidelines. People are, are you know keeping things clean, um, respecting each other, and 99% of the time that's the case. But it can again sometimes there's a slip up, and we need to make sure that that just doesn't happen. Given that you know we're not a thousand members, we're fifty thousand, and we have in excess of a hundred thousand unique visitors every month, and growing. So uh, having guidelines across the communities that moderators can can you know use, stick by, and and make sure that again they use that as well as the moderator only support community. Uh, they're able to share best practices and frankly make sure that things are as we want them to be. You know support, make sure you're not alone, getting helpful info. Coming back to whatever all the other speakers have, have, have kind of said on as as it relates to support and and and, and helping you through it, what can be a very challenging experience dealing with your 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 rare disease or just a, a condition in general. Does anyone have suggestions on how to um, have a team connect in a safe way? Um, um, I mean, I can. Uh, what I would say is, is uh, unlike. So the difference between us and, and a Facebook community is, uh, for, for us, it's Facebook is your first and last name appear on, on as, as we all know. But for us, our communities are all, um, we start as, for example, mine would be John, that's my username. So we're all anonymous. So again, it allows people to be uh, as open as they want to be, sharing of information, um, but at the same time, they're protected. Because as we all know, you can, go you can Google search and you could probably find my first and last name. but. If, if it was just John S. or, or, or uh, Frank, Frank S., you would never be able to find them. So again, you're protected, you're able to share information, you're able to be open in a way that you were never possible before, at, but at the same time knowing that you're protected and safe. So again, we ensure and, and, and are adamant that all our members keep a, a, a particular username as opposed to their first and last name just to make sure that they're protected and they remain, remain anonymous, especially as it relates to the internet. Now that would be a great blog topic, right? Because there has not been much attention to whole families. Um, we, and, and yet there should be so many genetic clues. And uh, so um, have you all ever thought about? I'm, 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 writing is not my gift for, by any means. Um, but I very much would love to find someone interested in you. seeing how many families are there because um, I feel like if you could get a few families that had um, a genetic test, I say a few, I mean however many, to, um, I, think, I think it would get the answer so much faster yeah. than it's just individuals that had it. But, you know, so often I'll see people say, oh, well, I was sick and when I was pregnant, blah, 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 and I had these kids and oh, now my kids are sick. So there's a lot of it out there and, and people are thinking it's not genetic. Well, I think and it's way more genetic. There's some than very interesting realize. research coming down the pipe on that. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, we'll come back to, to your comment. But uh, it would be interesting to team up with um, other people who are engaged in social media and who would like to help create social media uh, products um, around, uh, around people who are not quite as comfortable. You know, wouldn't that be an interesting sort of patient social media sort of surrogate blogger? <laughs> I've seen some good blog sites. The first thing we found was fructose malabsorption, and that's something you don't hear about, but I think it's really common. And we've seen seven uh, gastroenterologists, and it took nine years to get that diagnosis before the others came. And I find all the time on uh, the mast cell page and the POTS page, I'm seeing people that have described these. Uh, uh, unknown stomach aches, and I keep writing, check for just check it, check it, check it, because you won't hear it from your doctor. Um, but then I go, oh man, this person's name, I, it looks familiar, did I already tell them this? Am I telling someone the same thing for the sixth time? You know, so I don't know how to, with the social media, make sure you're not like harassing someone, making them feel like, oh, wait, I'm sure about the fructose muscles, you know. I, do, I feel that way sometimes because I talk about my autoimmune disease mm -hmm. and I feel like a broken record because people ask me about it so I repeat the, this is how you get tested and your doctor's not going to know about this so you have to find one that does. 
Um, and I think all patients who have, uh, especially within the dysautonomia community, you advocate for what you know. You know, mm -hmm. if you have multiple sclerosis, you're going to talk about that and teach mm -hmm. people about that and repeat it over and over again because mm -hmm. that's your thing that's affected you and that you've learned a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think we have to be careful when we're talking to other patients online about not over-diagnosing your own condition mm -hmm. just because it's prominent in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it's uh, you get a lot of good information sharing amongst patients. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about um, PBS from listening to other patients. And I went through a long time of thinking, like, do I have this? Do I not have this? I finally like talked to enough patients. And then finally, uh, one of the doctors on our board did the bait and scale test and said, no, you don't have EBS. And I thought, I'm like, well, OK, I thought I did based on what people were telling me. But anyways, it's, I think that um, another thing related to this is that these, this patient population, you rack up diagnoses. And it's, in my mind, I don't really think of it as I have 20 different diagnoses. I have one medical problem that and isn't really well understood. Showing up in all these ways. And it gets diagnosed as different symptoms, like getting diagnosed with migraine and POTS. Well, whatever's causing the migraine is causing the POTS, but you're getting two labels for it. And some patients, I don't want to say it's not a lot, but some patients um, carry those diagnoses. And it's an emotional burden to think you have 25 different diseases when you really probably just have one or two. So just be careful about that as you're sort of branding yourself on social media, who you're telling about all your diagnoses. Yeah, and I would add that that's a really, really good point that you make, that we do accumulate diagnoses. And when you come to doctors and you say, oh, here's my list of diagnoses, they're good, they're, there can be a tendency among certain treating physicians to look at you and just think, wow, you're doctor seeking. You're looking for problems. but. Almost everyone I know when they're diagnosed, the first thing they say is, well, why? Why do I have POTS? What's causing this? And I think it's normal to start looking for explanations. And that process of seeking an explanation leads to a list of 25 different things. And so you just have to be really sometimes very, um, you have to use judgment about what you need to pursue, what the value of the diagnosis mm -hmm. is. Um, an EDS diagnosis is good to know, especially if it's a vascular form. But at the end of the day, this is something I, I'm, I talk a lot about in my groups, is what is the value of the diagnosis in your treatment? Will it affect your outcomes? Will it affect your life? Um, knowing is good, and sometimes just knowing brings a certain amount of peace. But a lot of times, it's not going to change the meds you take. It's not going to change whether you can take salt you know, what's going to make the difference. It's, and at some point you have to decide if it doesn't really make a difference in my treatment, do I really need to pursue it? And that would just be kind of my suggestion. Um, uh, one thing I was going to suggest, and just so you know, Jared's not paying me to say this, I think you should go on crowd <laughs> Yeah, it's And I think you, yeah. if you, you have a positive dysautonomy diagnosis, but you haven't figured out what's causing it, I think it might be a cool project to have a, a few of us go on there and try to, um, you know, post your story as accurately, <laughs> concisely as you can. You don't want to scare off the medical detectives, <laughs> but um, to try to find, you know, recommendations on what your underlying cause might be. Um, in my case, it was they literally suggested children's, and the guy even suggested doing a minor salivary gland lip biopsy because the blood tests aren't accurate and. Like, for two years, no doctor said that to me. And then this guy in five days, I was so amazed. And I didn't, I didn't know anything about CrowdMed at the time. Somebody had sent me a link. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a kind of cool website. Let me see how good it works. So I put my weird case in. And within 24 hours, someone who I think was probably a patient, because the name was like, Zebra Mama. So like, Zebra's <laughs> <laughs> Zebra a patient of some sort. And she posted a link to the Vanderbilt POTS website. She said, I think you have POTS, you should go to Vanderbilt. I was like, wow. <laughs> and um, it's just, it's such a neat site. So I, I encourage you guys to utilize it and, and try to find some diagnostic answers if you're still looking. Well, let's thank all of our speakers and especially John for uh, tolerating all of the Skype uh, <laughs> difficulties. And, uh, and then I think that people will be available for just a couple of minutes um, for questions, although I don't know how long we have um, the room. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.